welcome to today's event at this year's Swindon Festival of Literature, which as a result of restrictions to prevent the spread of that virus has become a virtual online festival of literature. But thank you anyway for joining us. We do hope that everything is well where you are. We're both pleased and grateful that human ingenuity, cutting edge science and digital technology make it possible for this show to go on. Well, at least to go on online. Now, strangers do it. Friends do it, politicians do it, even chimpanzees do it. What do you do? When you meet and greet someone, are you a hugger, a cheek kisser, or a handshaker? Probably, since we are in times of COVID-19, none of these. In that case, can you remember which you preferred? You see, a parent book called The Handshake, A Gripping History, and here it is, these things matter. They matter a lot. In a minute, we'll find out why. Please join me in giving a Swindon Festival of Literature welcome to today's guest author, paleoanthropologist, explorer, and evolutionary biologist, Ella al -Shamahi. Ella, welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, it's very nice you're here, uh, um, and we're very glad you're able to take part, if only online. Um, it's a pity you can't be live in Swindon because Swindon in the spring is okay. In fact, it's very nice. Have you ever been to Swindon? I believe I have. However, um, I, I don't know about anyone else, but I feel like my brain can't remember where I've been basically because of lockdown. <laughs> I, I, I went to see, I went to Birmingham to see my parents um, and I genuinely seem to be blank on other locations. I, 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 yeah, I'm suffering right now quite badly from uh, yeah, from this kind of memory issue, which is perfect because, of course, I wrote a book. So it's not like I needed my memory. <laughs> um, Ella, uh, Swindon is halfway between Bristol and London and south of Birmingham, and we'll have you here one day, please. Um, but for now, we better get back to the topic in hand. Your new, your very new, your bang up to date new book on handshakes in the time of coronavirus with the title Handshake A Gripping History. Its first chapter asks where the handshake came from and its last chapter says where it might be going and in between you, you take a very close look at all kinds of significant body contact stuff. Um, Ella Al Shamahi please tell us more. Thank you so much, Matt. So um, first of all, I, I kind of, um, I'll just say that um, I have a number of friends and uh, press folk who are asking me, um, kind of quite amazed, they're not even asking me, they're telling me, wow, you're, you're really, you've got a book that's so timely. Um, and it, it kind of occurred to me that they all think I'm clairvoyant and that I was writing a book on the handshake <laughs> a few years ago and it just happens to be out in the middle of a global pandemic, um, a once in a lifetime, hopefully, pandemic. Uh, that's not the case at all. Um, this was a topic I had been thinking about extensively um, uh, for, for many years, but kind of extensively very much on a personal capacity. I'll explain um, why in a minute. Um, and uh, and then as as the pandemic started and uh, I was benched, shall we say, from all my expeditions and all my TV projects all over the world, um, rightfully benched, you know, I shouldn't have been kind of cavorting around the planet um, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, my uh, my agents said, look, um, are you interested in writing a book on the handshake? And uh, I started laughing because they had no idea how relevant this topic was for me because um, up until the age of 26, I actually almost never shook a man's hand because I followed a very, very strict interpretation of Muslim law, um, which uh, says that you should not touch a member of the opposite sex. And as I became secular, I started shaking men's hands and the joke was once I'd finally got used to the, the bloody thing, <laughs> suddenly there was a global pandemic and everyone was telling me not to shake hands. And I was like, no, what, what, hold on a second, what are we doing? Um, and of course, while it's absolutely um, the right thing to do, it's very interesting because a lot of, a lot of um, that background of mine um, 
felt like the dry run for what we're doing right now. So I'd already gone through the whole, okay, I'm not, not going to shake somebody's hand. So there's all this awkward, like, what am I going to do instead? Um, and so I would kind of practiced a whole pile of alternatives already. So the hand on the heart, um, you know, all of these I'd already done before, uh, but with men and now I'm doing them on Zoom calls. So, you know, that's, that's great. Um, I have to say, I never did the elbow thing um, or the foot tap, which is my current favorite. Um, and uh, I think it's it's kind of worth um, just addressing right at the top the, the big question which everyone keeps asking, which is, um, is the handshake, you know, should we ban it? Should we just kill off the handshake completely? Um, and I would say there is a thing called skin hunger. Um, skin hunger means you're not getting the touch you desperately want. You, it's the touch that you feel that you need. And skin hunger is a term we've had around for a while, but during the pandemic, there has also been kind of a pandemic of skin hunger. I actually dedicate the book to my nan because I haven't seen or touched her in over a year. Um, and I don't know about anyone else, but I am, I am very much in need of touch <laughs> and hug and hugs and handshakes. Um, I keep saying I'm slightly scared um, that when handshakes come back finally, um, I'm not going to be shaking people's hands as much as holding their hands really firmly for the entire meeting. Um, and um, look, guys, I, I know I know the statistics on on germs, and they're not fun. You know, at any given moment, there are 150 species of bacteria on your on your palms. Um, there was a global study which showed that only 19% of people globally, 19%, wash their hands after number two, not number one, number two. <laughs> um, now, of course you can say, well, you know, some people in the world don't have access to running water, et cetera, et cetera. 19% though is really low and that's not just about access. Um, because, you know, we, we also have statistics that show us really uncomfortable stuff on our own doorstep. The um, uh, one uh, London paper um, showed, it was actually the Evening Standard, um, they tested um, peanuts and other kind of foods in pubs and restaurants, kind of the, the stuff that's just laid out there. And they showed that only some of it could be said to be free of fecal matter, fecal matter. So I know that our hands are filthy. <laughs> I completely accept that. And yet I am 100% an advocate for the handshake once, once the pandemic is over. Um, or the worst of it is over because of its deep meaning to us and because of how important touch is and that's kind of where I want to start my talk so I'm going to um, share my screen right now there we go so you should be able to see both me and uh, the powerpoint presentation so the book is called the handshake a gripping history but really, it's also kind of very much um, part of a theme um, <laughs> with regards to a lot of my work, to be honest. Let me, let me say that again. A lot of my work seems to follow the theme of paradigm shifts. Um, so we, we often live in a world and then somebody says, no, this isn't quite how the world looks. Let's, let's kind of, you know, undergo a paradigm shift. And of course, it's not one person. It's usually a whole kind of manner of things that kind of move us into that, into that uh, different paradigm. And um, for, the, for the longest time, I have felt that the paradigms around the, the handshake are actually quite incorrect. Um, and just to kind of give you an idea of uh, some of my other work, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, Oh, that's not, let's not make strange noises. Um, so I am a paleoanthropologist um, and I'm a stand-up comic. Of course, that's the kind of combination that usually um, kind of, you know, sometimes lands you television work. So I'm also a TV presenter. Um, I, I personally love this picture because um, people used to tell me that uh, women aren't funny. Um, and I, I keep pointing out that I'm better looking than those two people. So, um, you know, it's all good. Um, but yeah, so this combination of me being a stand-up and a paleoanthropologist, um, a scientist, it's quite, um, it's an unusual combination. I, I think it, it's, you know, it's a good combination. I think it works, um, at least it's been working for me. Um, and 
I kind of have been trying to use that a bit to kind of challenge our understanding of certain things and our, our perception of certain things. Um, so uh, I'm just kind of going to whiz through one or two paradigms that I'm kind of really, really interested in shifting. And, you know, thankfully, there's a lot of other people that are also interested in shifting these. One is uh, the way that we view um, politically unstable territories like war zones, basically. Um, I uh, pretty much only do expeditions in conflict zones. And my argument for that is that it is a tragedy for science and it's a tragedy for uh, politically unstable places if we're not doing science there. It's actually a map of all the places which our foreign office have declared are politically unstable. You can see that's a lot of our planet. And if we're not doing science in a lot of our planet, that's not a great thing. Um, you've got to imagine that all the biggest discoveries are probably going to be made um, or, or a significant portion of the, of the biggest discoveries in the future are going to be made in these places. Because, you know, a place like Wales, people are still finding stuff there. People are still discovering stuff there. But how many scientists and academics are working there? A place like Yemen, Iraq, Syria, how many people are working there? Where are you going to find the big, the big discoveries in the future? Um, this is, is Yemen, it's actually where my parents come from, so I kind of have a special connection to that place. Um, this is uh, Socotra, um, it's an island between Yemen and Somalia, um, it actually belongs to Yemen. Um, I did a TED talk on, on this very topic. topic. Um, I won't go through um, this full video, but you, you, can, you can see it on my um, TED talk. Um, they actually describe Socotra as the most alien looking place on earth, and it is completely stunning. Um, it has these really, really unusual trees that look like something from a Dr. Seuss film. Um, the connection's not doing well with this video, so I'm just gonna switch through anyway, because I, I just kind of I'm trying to lay some, oh, now you decide to work. <laughs> All right, um, I'll move that along. Um, this is a cave in Iraq. Um, it's a Neanderthal cave. So a lot of Neanderthals have been found in this cave. This is the inside of that cave. Um, you may wonder why I'm showing you this with a picture of Andy Serkis, the, uh, the legend behind a lot of incredible characters, particularly animated uh, motion capture characters. Um, this is because um, we wanted to show that there was a massive paradigm shift in our understanding of Neanderthals. Um, so the traditional view of Neanderthals is that they were you know, knuckle dragging ape men. If you're called a Neanderthal, if somebody calls you a Neanderthal, that they are insulting you. <laughs> um, and our aim was to show that actually Neanderthals were these um, really um, very, very, um, very similar to us. You know, they're very human. Um, and one of the one of the ways that we decided to do that was to get a Neanderthal um, using uh, kind of the BBC and Andy Serkis getting a Neanderthal, scientifically accurate Neanderthal, one that was found in that cave in Iraq that I just showed you. We called him Ned, Ned the Neanderthal. Um, and we wanted to bring him to life. He is a particularly exceptional Neanderthal because he was actually disabled and he was quite old, which showed that he was only alive because his community was helping him stay alive. So really human-like qualities. We put this Ned on the London Underground and we asked the audience, if they would change carriages. And it was a wonderful moment um, because actually a lot of people wouldn't change carriages, though I will acknowledge a lot of them would have stared. Um, and, you know, a lot of my shows kind of really, uh, kind of, I'm, I'm just absolutely obsessed with this idea of us pushing our understanding of something that we've kind of just accepted. Um, female Viking warriors are a thing, um, you know, which was kind of still really problematic for a lot of people. A lot of people don't believe it. Um, we accidentally, while filming uh, a show, came across uh, what we think might be the um, kind of the first representation of a battle injury on a, on a female Viking warrior. So that's kind of um, a lot of what I think about quite extensively is kind of, you know, how to do paradigm shifts in our understanding of things. And um, kind of along those lines, I kept hearing something about the handshake and I and I saw it a lot at the beginning of the pandemic so if you ask people where the handshake comes from a lot of people shrug but the people that seem to know have this one answer and it's that it came from either missionaries or more likely um, medieval times um, and it was a sign that you weren't carrying a weapon. So the logic is um, that you use your right hand because that's your sword hand um, and uh, you're shaking up and down to dislodge any weapons that might be hidden up your sleeve. 
And I never bought that. Um, I never bought it at all. First of all, I work in a lot of hostile territories. If you ask me, being that close to anyone, <laughs> that just provides access. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think if you don't trust someone and uh, and that's your approach, it's probably not um, the the smartest thing to kind of yeah to be going that close to them. So I, I didn't buy that at all. Um, and I and, and actually, there's a really famous example: uh, President McKinley, who's a U.S. president. Um, actually was assassinated by um, somebody coming in pretending to shake his hands and instead shot him. So I, I thought, okay, if, if I disagree that that's the origin of the handshake, how old is the handshake? So one of the first things as an anthropologist that I think about is, do uncontacted tribes shake hands? It's a, it's a really basic question for an anthropologist to ask because uncontacted tribes are people who have opted out of communication with the outside world. So they have no communication with the outside world. That means that any culture they have doesn't come from globalization, the internet, missionaries turning up, um, oil prospectors or explorers. It means that it's a really ancient thing that they're doing. And I asked if uncontacted tribes shake hands. And actually, um, it's, it's absolutely fascinating because it turns out uncontacted tribes, there are references to a number of uncontacted tribes shaking hands. This is a clip um, of David Attenborough that, yes, amazingly doesn't work. <laughs> this is the one problem, um, by the way, with Zoom. <laughs> that um, These things don't always work, but I, I, will, I will paraphrase. David Attenborough has this fantastic story of him turning up to um, New Guinea and he was in search of birds of paradise. And um, there was this one tribe who were described by a neighboring tribe as cannibals. And he decided to go um, kind of into their territory, um, which was you know, very frightening for the neighboring tribe. And they said, we don't want to be a part of this. You're on your own, basically. So David Attenborough, being David Attenborough, went off um, with his cameraman. And um, this, some of the tribes start running towards him um, kind of making very, very loud noises and seeming quite aggressive. Um, David Attenborough um, stuck his hand out and they stopped and shook his hand and everything was fine. <laughs> now, the assumption is that they're an uncontacted tribe um, and they knew what a handshake was. Now, you might say, how do we know that this isn't some kind of cultural mirroring? You know, sometimes, I don't know if you've seen this, but sometimes somebody does something and you just mirror them because you're trying to be polite. It's possible, but we see it time and time again. Um, there's a, a very uh, famous kind of uh, expedition, the 1928 um, US sugar expedition. Uh, National Geographic covered this expedition. Um, and there were references to, again, handshakes between what we presume are uncontacted tribes. But the, the best evidence for this is actually uh, by a very uh, kind of prominent anthropologist who describes uh, meeting two tribes in New Guinea seven months after they had started making contact with the outside world. So it's a really, really good point to interview them. And they said that they were, they were very familiar with the handshake, they practiced the handshake, they had been practicing it before they had contacted the outside world. And there are similar references in the 1970s um, to Amazonian tribes doing, uh, uncontacted tribes doing the same thing. So I'm thinking, okay, the handshake sounds like it's pretty, it's pretty old in terms of humans. But see, it goes back much further than that. You can see here, two chimps shaking hands. Now, this is really interesting. We know that chimps shake hands. We've known this for a while. We know that chimps also hug each other. We've known this again for a while, but it's never quite been clear if this is something that's kind of just happening um, in captivity um, and it, what exactly its meanings are. Now, Dr. Kat Hovater is a primatologist. Um, she's based out of St. Andrews. And she did extensive research on the chimps and the bonobos in terms of their handshakes. And she showed that not only is the handshake always of positive meaning, she also showed that it's quite ambiguous in terms of its meaning, which is really interesting because, of course, that's that's kind of, so when I say ambiguous, sorry, I should have said it has it, its meanings can constantly change. Um, and that's really interesting because 
um, that's kind of the handshake in our culture. You know, a handshake can be a hello, it can be a well done, congratulations. Um, it has a few different meanings. Um, and she was able to also show um, this incredible footage of these two chimps going at each other in this fight, like really fighting it out and then sheepishly walking up to each other and shaking hands, essentially meaning let's make up. So the handshake in chimps has a very similar meaning to us. Um, I do think it's quite cute that they shake fingers um, and they sometimes shake feet. Of course, we don't shake feet. We haven't quite got there yet. Um, but if you think about it, the chimps and the bonobos are our closest living relatives. Generally in evolutionary biology, we assume that if species that are related to each other that closely all do something, it's because of descent. So that suggests that our last common ancestor who walked this planet about 7 million years ago, it suggests that that ancestor was shaking hands. So in the book, I basically hypothesize that the handshake is probably at least 7 million years old. Now, if we're able to show that gorillas are also shaking hands, that pushes it back to 10 million years old. Suddenly you're like, boom, the handshake isn't a medieval thing. <laughs> so um, for me, this was this was a really big point. And I, I kind of, I was like, you know what? I am so bored of this lazy medieval um, uh, kind of origin story for the handshake. Um, and it was something I really would love to see a paradigm shift in. Um, and uh, you might say, okay, well, what's the function of it? Um, so it's really important to remember, folks, that um, we're animals. I, I know we we love to think that we're not animals um, and that we've somehow evolved our way out of being animals, but we, we are animals and we actually communicate with each other, yes, via language, but also we communicate with each other via chemical signals, which I know is really shocking for people. Um, but chemo signals are fascinating. I, I find the research into them fascinating. I enjoyed writing about this so much. Um, they did a whole pile of experiments where they put gauze under people's armpits and they got them to watch happy films or sad films. Um, they showed, um, they took the, that gauze, they gave it to a different bunch of participants and those participants accurately reflected the emotion on their faces. Chemical signals are really interesting and we communicate with each other via these chemical signals. Um, and it's especially interesting because researchers were also able to show that the handshake touch and the handshake um, transfers chemical signals between people. Not just that, but they were able to show that uh, using hidden cameras, they were able to show that you're more likely to put your hand to your face and sniff if you shake hands than if you don't. So it turns out unconsciously, we are basically shaking each other's hands and sniffing each other so we're sniffing each other on contact which is absolutely fascinating um handshakes it's worth pointing out also rose in prominence um with democracy and gender equality um i i point this out because it's important to remember and we know this handshakes are one of a number of greetings um we've always had kind of multiple greetings um in existence we know this um uh, and in medieval Europe, certainly, a lot of the greetings were actually quite hierarchical. So there was uh, one greeting, for example, where you put your hands like this in between the hands of your master. Um, there were, of course, the curtsies, the bows, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think it's any um, surprise that as democracy was on the rise, gender equality was on the rise, you saw the handshake rise to prominence over all those other things like the curtsy. Um, and you see this in America as well, um, which is also very, very interesting. Um, the kind of global greeting behaviours are absolutely fascinating and a lot of fun to look into. Um, there is a small problem in that, of course, you massively overgeneralise. So, for example, we will say in England, ah, you know, people in England, they shake hands. But of course, we all know that, yes, a lot of people in England shake hands, but there are some people that don't like shaking hands. There are some people that like hugs. There are some people that don't like human contact at all. So you have to kind of caveat when you say that, you know, this culture does this and this culture does that, but we know there's lots of different kinds of greeting behaviors. Um, I will kind of just quickly mention some of my favorites because um, they're fantastic and wonderful. Um, the nose rub is definitely one of my favorites. It's practiced in a number of places in the world, including um, Gulf Arab states. 
Um, these the Liberian finger snap, which is where you shake hands and then you snap your fingers at the end, um, which is a wonderful one. Um, and then there are some ones which, um, you know, are much more fantastic. There's um, the penis handshake. Um, there are there is uh, the nipple suck, which are both now extinct, but were practiced um, in, in, you know, within the last hundred years, which is absolutely fa fascinating uh, by various tribes. There's the bum salutation, which was really interesting because it was practiced by many, many people globally. Um, you know, it was practiced all the way from Germany to Japan to parts of Africa. So there's many, many kind of fantastic greetings uh, that have now become extinct. Um, as for, um, let me just, yes. As for whether the handshake is going to become extinct, I will say this is not the first time that the handshake has seen a temporary demise. In fact, if you look at pandemics and epide epidemics throughout history, um, we see numerous cases of the handshake suddenly disappearing. Um, so in um, Prescott, Arizona, during the Spanish flu, the handshake wasn't just out of favor, it was actually made illegal. Um, in Philadelphia, um, kind of at the beginning of the United States, being the United States, there was a uh, yellow fever pandemic and people shunned each other's hands. In Baku, Azerbaijan, at the end of the 1800s, there was a cholera outbreak and uh, they formed an anti-handshake society. People would wear a, a pin to identify themselves and they'd pay a few rubles. In every single one of those cases and more, the handshake always came back. So I would say the handshake has not died in March of 2020. It is just social distancing like the rest of us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just gonna come out of this. If I can do this, stop sharing. There we go. Um. Ella, um, thank you very much. And you began your talk by um, making some personal points in your own life and then uh, uh, making some more general ones simply about the importance of touch generally. And we've had other authors at the festival speaking about this, especially during times of COVID. And, um, and in your book, you quote Kant saying, who says that the hand is man's outer brain. Um, and now, just now, you've referred to these other ways of people greeting or making deals, nose. And I saw something flash on the screen that was something about male genitalia included. Um, but anyway, um, uh, but, but there are many different parts of the body that are used to, 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 to make contact to suggest something between two people. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about the refusal, in other words, there's two parts to this, it strikes me. One is when somebody actively refuses, when somebody goes for a cheek and, mm -hmm. and misses or somebody puts out a hand, and then the actual outcome of not having some skin contact for a deal or a greeting. I wonder if you could say a bit more about that. Yeah, so I think it's important to remember, of course, that there are cultures all over the world where people um, primarily don't shake hands. So in parts of the Far East, the namaste is more common um, than the handshake. So we know that it's perfectly, people are perfectly able to function um, without the handshake, um, but touch, touch is clearly important and, it, and the hand is also clearly important. So I think the two extra points I would make on this is, isn't it interesting that even though the handshake isn't practiced in many parts of the world, uh, like in the Far East, their alternative often, mostly, still involves the hands. And I don't think that's necessarily by accident. I think one thing is they're practically available. But I think the hands are part of, are part of the reason that we're human. Um, the dexterity and the, the, the ability that we have to make tools, the kind of tools that we make, you know, chimps are able to make stone tools, or um, are able to make tools, but not the kind of tools that we're able to make. We have really interesting um, dexterity, as I said, and strength in our hands. Um, that means that we're quite flexible. Um, and so I don't think any of that's by accident. And, and what you end up with is a situation where when you don't reciprocate, and I have to say when you don't reciprocate whatever the greeting is, so whether it's a handshake, whether it's a namaste, whether it's a hug, it's a, it's a, it is a slight, and it's a slight 
I think it's, it's hard, obviously, because a lot of this is hypotheses, kind of hard to prove. But I think a lot of that has to do with um, reciprocity and symmetry being seen as quite important. So if you think about it, when I describe those medieval greetings, a lot of them being hierarchical, there wasn't symmetry in them. It was, you know, one person would be subservient and the other person would be less subservient. Um, whereas the handshake and the namaste and all those greetings are, are quite, there's a lot of symmetry in them. So I would say <clears throat> that that symmetry is really important. Um, and of course, there's different kinds of um, good faith, should we say, in symmetry. So for example, um, Trump is a really good example of somebody who, yes, may be giving you a handshake, but how much symmetry is there really? Of course, you know, we know that some of those some of those handshakes of his were more like tug of wars. I think, in fact, there's um, one between him and Emmanuel Macron. And it's clear that Emmanuel Macron had, had seen all these handshakes gone kind of, kind of a wire. And he decided to meet Donald Trump in his handshake and kind of, you know, meet that kind of strength. And you ended up with this 29 second handshake that just looked awful. I don't know how you feel, Matt, but I just thought it looked awful. <laughs> and it looked awful partly because it wasn't in the spirit of the handshake. You know, it, it's supposed to be that you're that you meet the person, you don't reject them. It's supposed to be the symmetry and it's supposed to be about equality and egalitarianism. I think that wasn't really happening. Um, uh, you, you mentioned the 29 second handshake and uh, I'm, uh, well, I'm not reading books. I, I'm a bit of a sporting man. I like tennis and so on. And there it's an absolute convention, um, the handshake, uh, because it kind of acknowledges anything that's gone on in the match and this idea that everything's all right afterwards even though it isn't because people go to the pub afterwards and moan about things and so on so 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 the handshake doesn't actually make up and and uh, as you mentioned in your book that sometimes when people do a deal and they shake on it it's actually because the paperwork is shaky and they're trying to cover up with a handshake cover up and uh, and, and so the 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 handshake is also a bit dodgy in 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 its role, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, I, yeah. So it, so we have to remember that um, the handshake is shorthand. So, for example, in, in business meet in business deals, um, the handshake kind of you know it's it's shorthand for okay, yes, we're we're signing on the dotted line, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> but it's not very robust. So yeah, I think my father certainly would never have been okay with me kind of signing a contract without signing the contract. The handshake alone is not enough. Um, and that's because, you know, you're going on good faith with the handshake. It's not the same thing as a signature on paper. And you're right. Um, yeah. In my research, I was able to show that there are some examples of um, people using the handshake where they were trying to avoid tax or they were trying to avoid certain, they kind of don't really want a paper trail. So they're like, we're just going to go in for the handshake. Um, I would say, you know, the handshake kind of makes sense in a world where most people were illiterate and therefore the handshake as, as part of a contract was, was useful because it was shorthand or if you're doing something really quickly, the handshake is shorthand. But I think in the world we live in today, while the handshake is great and important, oh my gosh, please get a contract. <laughs> you know, let, let's not do that. And, and as for the sports reference, yeah, that's a really interesting one. Um, some people have theorized that um, sport is a bit like an act of war in some ways. It's a fight, isn't it? It's two people kind of going at each other, whatever the sport is, and that the handshake is really useful to kind of end it and to say, look, this was just a game and it's not real. But you're right, of course, a lot of people are. <laughs> you know, it doesn't cover all sins. And, and it's interesting, the time we're living in now, that... A year ago, if I'd been told to go shopping with a face mask on uh, or to have a meeting with a face mask on, I'd have said, you, you've, you've got to be kidding. I mean, uh, my mouth is my main tool, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, I'm not covering my mouth up. I can't function. And lo and behold, there's a, there's a mask here in my pocket now, ready, ready for use. And, and we get used to things. So I wonder, and bearing in mind that there are people who aren't that keen on touch, and, 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 and they may be in the minority and somebody may say, oh, you've got this condition or that condition. Well, we've all got conditions along some spectrum, haven't we? And um, but actually, those people, I know people who are perfectly happy 
who are not as tactile uh, as I am or as you appear to be. Um, and so actually it's fine. And so I'm wondering how we come out of this pandemic, pandemic and we get, we get some um, conditions that the government gives us for what we can and can't do. And whether they're great scientists working for the government will have worked out which bit of bodily contact will spread least germs. Because in your book, you describe the number of, uh, of, of, of germs and bacteria and stuff that's on these hands, which go everywhere and then contact another person. Um, so might we not get used to some other way of satisfying our need to touch and, 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 and that that isn't the hand? I mean, I, there are definitely um, some like Dr. Anthony Fauci that would be quite happy if we never shook hands again. Um, and the suggestion is, you know, fist bump. I mean, even a fist bump transfers germs. So some people decided to suggest a fist bump where you just touch one knuckle, which seems like way too much effort for no gain. Um, of course, the elbow bump is a thing and the, the foot touch is a thing. Um, I personally suspect that all of those, that the elbow bump will enter our um, mix of greetings. And that if you have a cold, for example, um, you'll be much more aware of not shaking somebody's hand and instead of bringing them your elbow. Um, there have always been medical professionals, uh, certainly in the certainly um, since the 1900s, um, asking for people not to shake hands anymore. And interestingly, I, I remember reading an article from the 1920s by a nurse, kind of saying that she really wishes people would stop shaking hands and yet acknowledging that there was no way it was going to happen. And I think that's probably where we are. I think there'll be some people that are quite vocal and will say, look, we, let's just leave it. Um, it's better for us. Um, and there'll be other people that will say, look, it's just, it's never going to happen. I think that's where the majority of people will fall. And it's also important to remember that there's a trade-off. Um, when I was younger, um, there was a really strong move to Dettol, an antibacteria kind of put antibacterial um, spray on all surfaces. Um, around children, the idea being that let's just get rid of all the bacteria, all the germs, all the, you know, and about 10 years ago, people started saying, hold on a second. <laughs> Actually, we're noticing a rise in all kinds of allergies. And we wonder if it's associated with the fact that, you know, we've been over cleaning everything around children. Um, so I think, you know, resilient, uh, robust immune systems are also a good thing. And there's probably a trade off somewhere in between there. I would say just kind of as a final note, um, just being respectful of what the other person wants. If somebody doesn't want to shake your hand or somebody um, doesn't want to hug you, I think that's, we're going to be seeing quite a bit of that um, over the next year or two as people kind of slowly working their way back into the handshake and, and hugs. Um, just respect it, you know, be completely chill about it. Um, a, a last question, Ella, um, and it's, it's slightly away from the handshakes, but it is linked to it. And I'm asking you this because I know you to be a scientist, you're, you're a biologist, but you can say it's outside your remit if you want to. And that is the idea that instead of constantly protecting ourselves, we should expose ourselves more to the germs that are everywhere and build up our immunity. Um, doesn't evolution tell us something like that? So is there something to be said for going full on with, or not full on, but a step-by-step -step return yeah. to, to, to cheek kissing and to gentle hugs to build up our immune system. Is this crazy, what I'm saying? No, I mean, that's kind of what I'm kind of suggesting, but of course, you know, it's a, it's a balancing act because for example, if you did that right now, you could argue that, that you do it right now during, during the time of COVID and that would, the trade-off would not be a good one. <laughs> um, I think you have to have big pandemics under control for you to be doing stuff like that because it has to be it has to be building your immune system as opposed to you know killing you basically and there's there's a delicate balancing act there um so my own kind of advice is let's all hold off on shaking hands and hugging um until the government advice changes there's a suggestion that will be in in june um but let's let's wait and see how that all goes um and i think you know when we're allowed to hug and touch again um i completely respect the people that don't want to uh, but those who do Oh, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ella, thanks very much. Ella's book, um, which even has a hand sanitizer on it, so you can kind of imagine it's, 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 it's well infected. 
Um, um, it has terrific, um, on the contents page, has terrific chapter titles. So apart from it being kind of quite serious where, where Ella looks back at the history of the handshake and so on, there are chapters that say, um, uh, history's best handshakes. There's another one, history's worst handshakes. And you can have quite a bit of fun at the dinner table saying, what do you think was history's first, worst or best handshake? So th there's a lot of fun to be had with this book. Um, Ella Al-Shamahi, the Swindon Festival of Literature. Thanks you very much for coming to us online. And we hope you'll come back live one day. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> oh,